And I guess also many of these unmet needs in the stage four patient population also applies to the stage three patient population. And I think that additionally there, really the whole question about neoadjuvant therapy as we talked about. I think that the other, the other question there is, and this is applicable not only to stage three but to earlier stages, is can we do a better job of identifying which patients yes. need aggressive intervention versus which patients are those who really won't have the disease relapse? And the question is, is can we take, again, what we've learned about the molecular biology and the immunology of this cancer to, again, really personalize the management of, of earlier stages of disease as well? So really what you're saying then um, with this, Mike, is that moving away from kind of a pure histological way of looking at this, but more of a, a biological and biomarker perspective, trying to determine that even if you have a thin melanoma, but you may have a much higher risk of recurring compared to other thin melanomas, and identifying those patients up front through that. Absolutely, or a patient with stage three disease who actually is one of those patients who won't relapse and therefore shouldn't go through the risk through the of, adjuvant therapies. of adjuvant ipilimumab yes. would, would be actually a powerful advance as well. Yes. I think that the biggest question we have in stage three disease is do we use anti-PD-1 in the adjuvant setting? And there's been uh, clinical trials that have been accrued. There's a, a clinical trial from bristol myers Squibbs that was comparing ipilimumab at high doses with nivolumab. There's a, an ongoing, ongoing study in EORTC of pembrolizumab versus, uh, versus placebo. And then there's the ongoing uh, US intergroup trial of S1404 which is actively enrolling uh, patients uh, comparing pembrolizumab uh, with uh, a control arm that's either high dose interferon or high dose uh, ipilimumab. Uh, that is a study that we're really, uh, uh, we would really like to see the results. If we're able to impact with single agent anti PD1 in, in, in stage three melanoma, what would prevent melanomas going from stage three to stage four? would have make a big benefit to, uh, to this uh, population and to the field. Yeah. Very good. Well, I want to thank you all. I think this has been very informat informative and really learning about the uh, current landscape of treatment for patients with uh, advanced melanoma. So before we finish, though, I'd like to have, see if you have some, uh, some final uh, thoughts about this uh, from this. So, Georgina, any final thoughts about where we are at the moment and where we're going? I think we've got a wonderful foundation. It's been an absolute pleasure to be part of this um, knowledge and to have patients who respond in the last five years it's been fantastic but we still have a lot of work to do primary and acquired resistance for all treatments is still an issue and poor prognostic factors the patients with high ldh is still an area we need to work on and brain metastases so that's that's what i'd say it's fantastic and joy with what we've done but we've got a lot more work to do and we need to enroll patients in clinical trials mm. mike you know, I think we've also been in a melanoma space really lucky that our treatments uh, targeting the BRAF mutation, for example, and immune checkpoint blockade have happened earlier in melanoma than they have in other diseases. And so we have an opportunity within melanoma to share our knowledge of immune therapies and targeted therapies really across the oncology spectrum. And I think we're very grateful for our melanoma patients that first entered these clinical trials and all the investigators and physicians that have worked on this. And I think we have a duty now to really share that experience with many other diseases where we're giving some of these checkpoint inhibitors and targeted therapies. And I think that's a huge opportunity and we should really think of our role more broadly and not just melanoma, but really helping patients with many different types of cancers, what we've learned in the melanoma space and which I hope we continue to learn. Yeah. Tony. Well, all this progress that we're talking about hasn't come uh, by chance. It's all been by applying knowledge to patients. It's been by understanding biology of melanoma, what drives melanoma to grow, how can we impact on it, and how does the melanoma interact with the immune system, and how can we empower the immune system to attack the melanoma. We made progress, I think we'll continue to make progress, but since this is a knowledge-based exercise, we then learn more about when it works, why it worked, and when it didn't work, why it didn't work, and what we should do next. And right now, we have several questions where we don't know what the next step is, but all of these science that's coming back from the patient to the laboratory will allow us to go back and develop the next generation of studies. Yeah. Mike. Um, again, I agree completely with, with uh, all three of my colleagues. I think, again, what was sort of illustrated in each of the cases we've discussed today 
is still that need to identify the ways to optimi optimize the personalized therapy for each patient. So how do we actually use our existing therapies most appropriately still remains a challenge. It's a challenge that's much more pleasant now as we have better therapies, but again, we still have a lot of clarity still to be achieved with identifying what is the right treatment for each patient. Yeah. Very good. Well, I want to thank all of you for participating. I also want to thank our viewers uh, for, uh, for um, viewing here. And I hope that this peer exchange discussion has been useful for you and informative. And um, I want to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.